كابو 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 ما نحترم قيمة الكابو وابن الكابو حنا بدو حنا بدو ما نخابنا العنوان Welcome to the 8th episode of Tahir Podcast My guest today is Laura Kazinov. I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's as good as as good as it gets. <laughs> yeah, Laura happened to be uh, not happened to be. She was in Yemen as a freelance journalist, and as she was there, the Arab Spring unfolded. And during that period, she reported for the uh, New York Times, and later uh, wrote and published a book about that whole experience. And um, we'll get into it. Welcome, Laura. Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. The pleasure is mine. So let's like briefly. So since we don't have much time, um, can we talk about your upbringing, how your childhood was like, and, and so forth? Sure. Yeah. Um, I. Oh man, it's it's hard to know where to begin with that. But um, it's not always the first question when someone asks me about Yemen. But I. Uh, I'm from a small town in the U.S. in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm an only child, um, and my my parents had very like normal jobs. My dad's an optometrist, an eye doctor. And my mom was a teacher, but then they ended up running a small business together, an optometry business. Um, mm-hmm. And anyway, that said, I. Um, my father loved to travel and he loved to travel to places that were not uh, sort of the typical destinations for Americans who were traveling overseas. And then also the way that he traveled wasn't necessarily typical. You know, there are no tours, there are nothing like that. It was, you go to a place, you find someone uh, to talk to, someone who could help you and, you know, they take you somewhere and that sort of thing. Um, So my so so anyway when I was and 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 so I grew up doing that and was my, my I was an only kid and my parents just took me wherever and um from starting at a very young age and this is actually this is a funny story <laughs> but it's true it's it's I, it's it's relevant in uh it's kind of relevant in how I ended up in Yemen but I um I know I've never said this publicly I don't think but when I was six we took a trip uh to Egypt and I have a few memories from that trip and I don't I don't have like a lot of memories as a young child but I definitely remember that trip I mean this would have been 1991 in Cairo and I remember the streets as I remember like just you know the busyness of the streets of being crazy but then um, we went to the zoo <laughs> and they let me feed all the animals at the zoo and as a six-year-old I was like a six I thought this was like the best thing in the world and when I was a child as well, I, I was very blonde and I had this like blonde curly hair. Um, and I think that it got a lot of attention and I was pulled in and, and you know, for, surely for Bekshish, I'm sure that now that I know I was, I was allowed to feed all the animals. And so I like loved the trip to Egypt. It was like the best. So I had these like warm feelings in my mind as a child from that trip. But, uh, and it's partially why I studied Arabic in college. It's a funny, but anyway, which, which kind of influenced my life but anyway that said it's I did go to Egypt growing up which which I had more memories about um and it influenced my life but you know but we traveled a lot and my, my father was very interested in the rest of the world and sort of interested in esoteric details about the rest of the world and and then I became interested in that as well and we were always watching documentaries international documentaries in my house growing up and um like reading books about other cultures and I just I, I hated being from a small town and I just wanted to get the hell out as like quickly as possible. And I think that starting when I was in high school, I, um, I started to realize that if I, I could study a foreign language and maybe like do some sort of international job, I never thought about journalism. I was more so like work for the state department or work for the UN or work for an international NGO or something like that. But I was like, I'm going to get, this is going to be really exciting. I'm going to get out. And I think it's because I had so many fond memories of travel as a kid. Um, And then even I have a memory of when I was 16 years old, deciding I'm going to study Arabic and I'm going to study abroad at AUC. (laughs) So at the American (laughs) University in Cairo when I was 16 and then it happened. So it was, I was really, I was really determined as a child for what I, that I was going to get out. Um, And yeah, and which, and then it happened, but uh, that's, but yeah, it was kind of, um, 
I don't know, like definitely running away, let's say, you know, running away from, uh, from small town, white US culture. Hmm. And what about high school? During high school, what were your interests back then? I'm uh, assuming Yemen wasn't on the list, right? Yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. Besides my, my, uh, you know, I became very interested in like Israel Palestine. So I was like, oh, I'm going to work for like peace in Israel Palestine and I'm going to study Hebrew and I'm going to study Arabic and I'm going to work there. And, you know, it was that sort of thing, uh, which is funny because I've never worked there. But I, uh, that's not true. I spent a summer in the West Bank uh, working with Nablus University. But uh, anyway, the, uh, what was I going to say? I, um, yeah, I, what were my interests? You know, I was into sports. I, uh, the truth is, this is, this is, a, um, a few people know this as well, uh, but I was actually into figure skating. So I, and, and I have other friends who were in Yemen who were also figure skaters. So it's a funny, I'm like, what? I think there's something about being independently focused and doing so, that then, I don't know. I don't know quite what it is, but, um, Alex Potter, who was also a journalist in Yemen, was also a, a, an ice skater when she was young. But I was I was into sports. I was into doing my own thing. You know, I had I had friends, but but like um, I was sort of like friends with everyone and never anyone super closely. Um, mm. I was super. I had a lots of cousins. I my mom has seven siblings, and I have a yeah. It's like Arab style, yeah. and or at least Yemeni style. Uh, and I have I uh, twenty nine first cousins, and we all lived in the same small town basically. So I I grew up with that. Like they were my best friends. Um, yeah. And yeah, I don't. I you know I was. I was, I was trying to think about my, I was, I would, I would just, I was reading a lot of books always and just dreaming of getting out into sports into, you know, typical kind of typical things, but in other ways, not typical. So, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't like, I hated, like, I mean, I was into my own sports. I hated like typical school drama stuff, like football and American football and cheerleading. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just like, this is stupid. I don't <laughs> like this. I was so, so it wasn't typical in that way, but uh, yeah, what, what else? I was, um, I was into drama. I did some theater as a kid. I don't know, just, mm. which then came up later because I was an actor in Yemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll come later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, in, uh, in college, so you studied Arabic and I'm assuming you studied political science, right? So, yeah, something. yeah, yeah. I was going to do, I was going to get a degree in political science, but then mm. I, I took an international relations course and I, I didn't really like uh, game theory that much. So then I was like, this is stupid. And I really liked my, uh, I was taking some like Middle East history classes and things like that. And I was much more interested in that. Now thinking back on it, I think I should have like studied history, I think. But at the time, I don't know. I was, you know, you're thinking like, maybe I'll go to law school. Maybe I'll do that. You know, I don't know. Political science made sense. But anyway, then I, I actually ended up getting a degree in Middle Eastern studies, not in political science. Um, I sort of enjoyed those classes more. I almost got a dual degree. I, I have a major in, in Middle Eastern studies and a minor in political science. So, mm. and I almost have like a double major. So, um, but yeah, I studied, I studied Arabic. You know, it was also a post 9-11 world. So it was mm. like, Arabic was it seemed like you know everyone saying they want you know yeah, that's what the Arab market uh, needs <laughs> yeah it seemed it seemed and then so I remember thinking again like when I was in my first year in college thinking um should I study Arabic or should I study Russian and then I was like well you know Arabic is in Russian is out so that's not the case so much anymore but anyway and then I was like uh um and in the Middle East it was really warm and Russia's mm. cold, and I like hate being cold. So, and I remember feeding the animals at Cairo Zoo when I was six. So that's why I studied Arabic. It was not for anything noble, you know. It's not for any like noble reasons. It was just that I was, I wanted to be warm. So that's why, and 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 then everything followed from there. But, yeah. So before okay. moving, before moving to Yemen, you 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 wrote in the book that there was this party you were attending at uh, in Washington D.C let's go slightly before that so sure. uh, i'm assuming at that point you you um, you were like three years in after graduation right i think too i think i know that was just my 
I spent, let me see, I graduated. I spent one year in Egypt mm. and then that was like a year and a half post or uh, almost two years after graduation at that party. Cause that mm. would have been January 28, 2008. Yeah. So, cause it was when Obama was inaugurated the first term. Mm. So, so in Egypt, when you were in Egypt, I think you, you were a teacher, I think, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, you taught. Yeah, English. yeah, yeah. Well, what happened is I got, I went, okay, so when I was in, I wanted to, I studied abroad at AUC, and then I wanted to go back to Cairo because, you know, it was, it was a good time. I mean, I, I also, I just want to say up front that, like, a lot of this good time you know I, I it's I as I'm older now and can reflect back on it you know a lot of it I think is based on like neo-colonial like sort of white per, you know the yeah. special treatment you get as a white American in Egypt so I don't want to I don't want to say that's not true that that being mm. the case I also very much you know enjoy parts of cult, the you know I, you know I enjoy Egypt I enjoy you I mean Yemen you know you see the good parts and the bad parts and, and all the rest but definitely at the beginning when I was younger part of it was based on like that sort of like oh special treatment in uh, in this part of the world. But anyway, that being said, mm. I wanted to go back to Cairo, uh, and so I um, and, and I had an internship my last year of college at Seeds of Peace, that like small NGO that does like Israel Palestine stuff and plus other parts of the world. Um, and I, there was an Egyptian woman who worked for Seeds of Peace, and she. Uh, worked or was principal or something like this at a school uh, in Heliopolis I think or somewhere like that when you know an international mm. school but not a yeah. big one like one of the smaller ones mm. and she and she was like oh you can work as a kindergarten teacher at the school I mean I had no experience in teaching it was so it was so, so sad. and then it, and then the school was like falling apart when I got there that woman had left and like it, the school was a disaster I would like all of every all the teachers were quitting and it was one of those and you know he felt that I remember the parents calling me saying should I pull my child out of the school and I'm like I don't know what you should do but it uh I, I wonder if it's I can't even remember the name of it anymore but uh you know so I quit after a month and I ended up getting a job at a small business magazine that was like only existed for like two years in Cairo it wasn't business what was it business today or something it was like another and it wasn't Egypt today and it was it was like a tiny English language magazine called ICT business that it existed for two years and um mm. I got a job as a as like a proofreader there and from there start but then I started to meet other journalists and then I started to write articles for them and then I realized that then I start to freelance for like Daily News Egypt and Egypt Today and sort of the mm. local publications. And, and from there, I started to work in journalism, but it was like really not something I planned to do. I just kind of met people who were doing it and then thought this sounds, this seems like an interesting thing to do when it, um, it checks all the boxes of things that I like. Also, the first article I ever wrote for my, of, like for non-Egyptian publication mm. was an article for something called the Middle East Times that doesn't exist anymore, but it used to exist, and mm. it was American, and it was about how Egyptians used Facebook for act political activism, <laughs> so, and that was in 2008. So mm. I can't. It was. Uh, it's just funny to think back on it. That's the first story, but that was the first story that I wrote, and at the time it seemed new. You know, people mm. and people were using Facebook for activism. It was a long time ago. So now, what about the the Washington D.C. party where? It all started basically. <laughs> ah, yeah. So then I, then I went back. Okay, yeah. So then mm. I, I went back to the U.S. thinking I was going to go to grad school, because mm. uh, that was always the plan. And I was just kind grad of grad school in um, Middle Eastern studies. No, I was going to study do it in international affairs. So it was mm. like an it was like uh, it was at the New School in New York, and it was a master's in international affairs and uh, media actually. Um. And I, it was always sort of the plan because I was thinking like I need a master's in international affairs if I want to do work for the UN or something. You know, I kind of thought I'm going to leave, you know, I don't know what this journalism thing is, but the more practical thing is to pursue work. I, at that point, I realized I did not want to work for the government um, mm. <laughs> because of living in the Middle East, you kind of see the bad things the US government does. So I thought now, you know, I want to work for like international NGOs or something like that. Then you see all the bad stuff they do. But I know, I mean, <laughs> they, do, they do good stuff too. But um, anyway, so then I, uh, then I, 
anyways, I was doing that master's and then I kind of, I withdrew like immediately. I was like, this is, this is going to be an enormous waste of money. And it's not, and what I, like, it kind of just occurred to me, I was in New York and it occurred to me, what I really wanted to do was be a journalist in, like in the middle. I wanted to go back and be a journalist. I missed it. I was mm -hmm. like, this is always a huge mistake. I can't believe I made this mistake. So then I withdrew before like we had to pay any money because it, it, was, it was like the day of if you withdraw by this day that you don't have to pay so yeah. I uh, I did it and not to say you know I'm sure it's worth it for some people for me I just I really felt like it, would, it wasn't the right thing to do and then I got a temporary job in New York working as an assistant to an author um, and I was also had a sort of a uh, an assistant job at Human Rights Watch um, as like a secretary job and then um, but I was, I was thinking, you know, I want to go back to the Middle East. I want to go back to the Middle East and report. I didn't necessarily, necessarily want to go back to Egypt because I knew that there were a lot of foreigners trying to be journalists in Egypt. So I knew mm -hmm. that like the market was saturated and it was a difficult thing to do. So I was thinking maybe to go to Syria, but, you know, it was, it's hard to work there. But some people were doing it um, at that time. But then I was at this party in DC and it was an Obama inauguration party. And it was all of my friends from study abroad AUC were at this party. And uh, one person who was a friend from study abroad AUC after college had moved to Yemen to study Arabic. Hmm. Um, his name is Kyle and uh, he was at the party. And I, you know, I told Kyle, you know, I have these jobs in New York, they're ending and I don't know what to do. I don't know where to, I, I want to try to be a journalist but I don't necessarily think I should go back to Cairo. And he said to me, he said, his words were, dude, go to Yemen. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, he's like, it's the best place. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's dirt cheap. People are friendly. There's no journalists there. There's tons of stories there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's a lot safer than people think, you know, especially at, at that time. So you should go to Yemen. And it just, I, it, the, the, I remember as soon as he said it, the idea clicked and I thought that's a great idea. I'd never thought of it before and, or anything. Um, and then I sort of did some research and I thought that, you know what, I think this is a good idea. There were at that time, no foreign journalists covering news for foreign media. There were foreign journalists working for like Yemen today, which is kind of like mm. Egypt today and things like that, but no yeah. one covering it for international media. So I thought this is a great idea. So, um, so then I went, so then I left and moved to Yemen and I knew, I knew one person there. So it wasn't like a complete, no, I knew two people there actually. So it wasn't mm. a total, both Arabic students, but it wasn't like I moved there and didn't know anybody at all. And it was all new. Um, and I enrolled at Calais, which is a, an Arabic school in the old city. It was an Arabic school in the old city of Sana'a. Um, I assume it's not functioning anymore, but, uh, and I enrolled there and, you know, you can get your visa through. Well, at that time you didn't need a visa. So, um, it was, it was a lot easier to go and, um, yeah, and it was great. You know, you lived in the old city of Sana'a, which is like mm. this amazing place in this world. Uh, so beautiful with this, with the gingerbread houses and, uh, and, and it, and it went from there and it was, it, you know, it work went you know it was slowly at first and then it went better and, and better and it was good you know Yemen's obviously very good for learning Arabic because very mm. few people speak English and I you know spending time with the Yemenis who didn't speak English and uh yeah then got to and, and sort of slowly you know appreciate things about about Yemeni culture uh which are you know some things about the culture in the Middle East in general but I you know and it, like the for people, you know, the senses, the sense of humor, things like that, that are that are really mm. lovely. Um, yeah. And, uh, how, how long did, did it all start? Like the protests and the, the chaos. How long? Okay. Yes. So that was I moved there first. So I first moved there in 2009. So it was mm. you know pretty no 2010. I no 2008. Oh my, I have mm. no idea. Anyway, it was it was significantly before 2009. So it was significantly before the Arab Spring. So then I spent a year there and then I actually went back to Cairo and I worked as an assistant at the New York Times office in 2010. And then I moved and then um, I moved back to Yemen. It, so it's kind of going between Cairo and Yemen. I moved back to Yemen in the very end of 2010, thinking I wasn't going to stay that long, like thinking this is going to be a short term thing. I, I just I, I got to get back to the U.S. and get a job in journalism, you know, like I got to get back to the U.S. I got to get back to the U.S. This is. I'm just like kind of freelancing here, here, there, but let me move back to the US. So that was at the very end of 2010. So then, you know, the protest started at, let me think, the, 
it's now it's hard to remember exactly. I mean, they started in January. I think they they started very small before, you know, right before Egypt started, I think. They were just very, very small protests kind of after the Tunisian revolution. But then I, I don't want to get the timeline completely wrong. It really, the protests truly kicked off in terms of people went protesting before, uh, without like, not like organized protests, uh, organized by the opposition party. And it was like every Thursday at this time, we'll go stand in front of Sanaa University and we'll protest, but actual just like mass coming to the streets started the night of the Egyptian revolution is when it started. When, uh, January 25th, 28th. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and did you think it, it would uh, get this complicated? I think that when it started, definitely not. I mean, and this is like early January, definitely not. We all just thought it was going to be, I mean, in Yemenis as well, you know, it, it mm. seemed to be uh, kind of like maybe something that the opposition party, Yemen had a, or still has a, um, you know, what do you call it? A coal an opposition coalition. So there was the ruling party, which is the general people's con Congress or um, in Muqtamar, as mm. they say in Arabic, yeah. and then the J. JMP, which are the joint meetings parties, which is dominated by the Islamist party, El Islah. But then, you know, there's other groups as well, like the Socialist Party and like Nasserists and Baathists and these sorts of things. But definitely the two strongest are the El Islah and Socialists in terms of JMP, the opposition coalition. But anyway, they were protesting and they we just kind of thought that they were going to use use the use what was happening elsewhere to sort of like leverage against Saleh to try to maybe get him to make some concessions and that seemed like what it was at the beginning for sure um it wasn't and then when people started kind of young people start going out like independent young people that's when it started to be like oh holy shit and then of course you know after the Egyptian revolution that's when it was like this is, you know, this is might actually happen here. So like it's that's when it became big in Yemen. Um, it wasn't until the Egyptian Revolution. At first, I mean, I remember watching the protests in Egypt on TV in Sanaa and thinking, like, what's happening here is nothing compared mm. to what's happening in Egypt. It's not good. But then it it just it it after the Egypt Revolution, it just changed and it was like young people just going and then and then it's just it, you know, every day got bigger and bigger and bigger until probably by beginning of February is when it seemed like, wow, this is um this is this is like it's happening here too um in a really major way as well and it's not it's got it's grown out of the hands of the opposition party that's when it really you really saw it kind of i mean the is el islah always had a kind of a stronghold at the protest but there was also mm. something going on there that was out of their hands and that's like that kind of happened after the i would say after the in a major way after the egyptian revolution there were always independent young people going out so the even the the protests that were organized by the opposition party but they weren't that many um and they really it really became a thing after the revolution if i'm i don't want to get anything wrong but that's mm. you know now it's so funny 10 years ago it's like things start to slip from your memory but mm. um th that's generally how i remember it i also want to say that it was a little bit different in taz which is like a city in the in, a, in central yemen between sanaa and Aden. And it always has been an opposition movement there. And I think there they were having more mass protests before they had them in Sanaa even. So I don't want to, and Taz often gets let out, left out of things. So I've, it, mm. it, you know, they, they had people I think going to the streets and more independent people going to the streets even before that happened in Sanaa um, mm. in sort of the early January. But yeah, no, mm. no one, I mean, it took, it, it definitely took Yemenis by surprise. I mean, it was, it was that sort mm. of thing. And I remember feeling the fervor, I remember like, feeling the shifts when like you would get in a taxi and the taxi driver would start talking about it to me like really excited you know very he was very excited and talking about what was going on and everybody was talking you know it sort of became like this shift where and then people weren't afraid to talk about it anymore and uh yeah it, 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 it was really that that those early times were like were so special obviously mm -hmm. and um as you know I don't yeah and in Sanaa people like just made a sit on and sit in and lived on the streets in front of Sanaa University. I mean, for months on end, they just lived in tents. <laughs> it was insane. <laughs> I mean, some people would come and go from the tents, you know, like yeah. not sleep there all the time. But I mean, it was it was like a social event. I mean, it was really mm. and there were women there, too. I mean, it was really the, the, there was a the women tend not to sleep there, obviously, but they, they'd be there during the day. And um, it was 
it, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a big social, social event. And, and the other thing that was so special is that Yemenis mixed from different backgrounds, never got a chance to mix before. And I don't know if that also happened in Egypt or that often, you know, but, you know, Yemen was really a place with like, you know, like, it's like, imagine in Egypt, if it was like Saidis and people from Cairo, like yeah. hanging out together or something, you know, it was like that, like it was people from the countryside who who were like enemies or just like had nothing in common with people from let's say like educated people from Taz but who were living in Sana'a because Taz was a bit more of like a less tribal more cosmopolitan place like they were mixing and talking and sharing ideas and things like that and um yeah. I mean there were also Houthis there at the protest which we which I like unfortunately ignored and mm. should not have <laughs> since they're playing a very big role today uh it seemed like the Islamist party was the thing, you know, at that point mm. was going to be the ones in control, not the Houthis, but anyway. What are some of the most memorable uh, memories you've had? Like you basically met the whole, the big, uh, big bucks, <laughs> the Al-Ahmars, yeah. you know, all of them, you know, who, who yeah. did you meet? And to... Oh, that is a good <laughs> question. I want the right, I want the right answer to come to me because there were so many memorable moments. So I don't mm. want to say something that like wasn't really, you know, because uh, maybe some of the big bucks and then get into the, the motorcycle one where you drove through a sniper fire. <laughs> oh, yeah. Was at the time that, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, there's scary, memorable moments, then there's like pleasant, memorable moments. So there's like, you know, the mix, that mix all together of like both scary and I don't, oh, God, it's hard to, it's hard to, to sort out what is the, I mean, there was a time, I mean, for, in terms of like ridiculous stories, there's this, I, this, this isn't necessarily like a pro Yemeni story though. So I tell, but the story of when I got detained by this dude who was like a Balataja guy, leader, and then he detained me in his house. And uh, that was the most, oh my God. Yeah. And uh, he ended up being, he's like, he ended up being, he was like Yemen's biggest wheat trader, uh, wheat, not weed. Weed yeah. trader <laughs> and uh <laughs> probably weed as well but anyway he uh he was like i you know i got i was like hiding in this time when they started shooting at the protest and it was typically we could get away but this time i got stuck like inside when they were shooting and then um soldiers came in and saw me and took me away because mm. i was an obvious foreigner and um I then they soldiers had they kind of had me in this group of Balataja and then this guy who was like the leader of the Balataja came and uh spoke English and was like where are you from and I'm like I'm American he's like or I think I was like Anna Ambrikea and he's like you speak to me in English you fucking bitch where are you from <laughs> and I was like I'm American please and then he's like you work for Islam you work for Islam you're a you're an Islamic bitch how much does this law pay you and I'm just like I don't get paid by Islam what do you and he's yeah it was so ridiculous um and then he kept me in his house for a while and then I actually got really lucky and then I just was like oh god I did also didn't have any ID on me or anything so I didn't want him to give me political security um I knew it would get figured out who I was after a while but I just thought in that meantime it might be problematic so I I really didn't want to go to political security um and he took my phone but then he pressed the number of who I called last mm. and he saw um oh my phone rang and he answered it and then he pressed the number and it was I think a, I can't remember who that was I think that was an American friend and that but then he pressed the number of who I called last and I fortunately had like called last this sheikh who's kind of a government sheikh it was also happened to be his sheikh like it was a total coincidence and it was so lucky um I, it was lucky I didn't have a number of because uh, I also call people who are in the opposition, you know, all the time. Mm. So to get quotes and things like that. So I mm. was lucky there wasn't someone like that. And then he said, how do you know this guy? But then that helped me. And then he called the guy and the guy said, oh, she's someone important. I forgot that this guy was drunk too. That was also mm. a part of the story. He was totally drunk the whole time. Um, anyway, he says, how do you know her? And then uh, he said, oh, she's important. You know, don't give her to political serve uh security drive her to the american embassy right now like drive her to the american embassy mm. so then i still was waited for like another hour he like wouldn't you know he was like screwing around um meanwhile this guy the sheikh sends like a, like two helix trucks like full of armed like tribesmen to come pick me up and he doesn't give me to them he's like no i only give you to the sheikh himself and i'm like oh my god eventually he drives me to the american embassy and um 
his, his son drove I was in the car and then the funny thing is I got into the car behind in the back seat and he like reached mm. under his seat and grabbed a Kalashnikov and then like <laughs> gave it to me and was just like hold this so he said like hold this and I'm just like holding this Kalashnikov hoping that it's one like it's not gonna go off in the car anyway we get to the American embassy and uh it was in the middle of the night too when we get there and at this time I called someone to come meet me um this like American you know ser citizen service person was going to come meet me but as we pull up to the embassy the guy like rolls down his window and yells out to the guard at the embassy he said like I saved this I saved this girl from the Balataja and I want a certificate <laughs> she's a very important American and I want a certificate <laughs> I want a certificate for saving her. I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, that was one of, that was like a ridiculous story. That was not, it ended up okay. And it, it was, it was also just like a ridiculous Yemen story, but, um, but in terms of, oh God, like the most, I still am like struggling with the most memorable, you know, there's like such, the motorcycle there were just one. what's the, is the motor, what's the motorcycle, motorcycle one? one? When you rode through sniper fire, you wore a uh, bulletproof vests and helmets and drove through a uh, sniper fire. No, that wasn't, I didn't, wait, no, I, I never wore, wore bulletproof vests in Yemen. So that is, the story is, is getting confused. I, I'll say, yeah, I, I didn't, I never, I never, I never went to wear bulletproof vests. No, no, maybe, maybe it, went, it wasn't bulletproof vests, but I think that there was this part where you, um, there were sniper snipers stationed you around know, the, the square. Maybe that was that time, or there was. Okay, I'll tell you something, and this I wrote about in my book. And this person, mm. I'll say that. I, okay, this was a, a one of the crazy things. It's the first. It's the first time that they, um, the first time that they really started shooting at protesters. It was March 18th, um, mm. which Yemeni is called Jumat al Karama, and uh, I showed up at the square, and it was. Um, it just kind of seemed like any other day, but it was really big. And like a few people had died, um, you know, at that point they were sort of be standoffs with soldiers and a few people would die, but it was never like a lot of people. Mm. And then um, it was Friday, so it was after prayer and right as prayers were ending and I was approaching the square, they started, they, um, snipers that were positioned around the square and started shooting down into the square and they, and, um, they killed about 52 people, but like shot probably about a hundred others and all within like really quick time, you know? So mm. it was like really, really, really intense. And I went and hid, uh, behind a wall or like behind a gate that was like a gate leading into houses. And, you know, again, you like really utilizing that like white American privilege in Yemen. They, you know, anytime someone saw me running, they would help protect me. I mean, it was just very... Yemen is very much protect uh, foreigners kind of culture mm. and also very much protect women. So it was, you know, I had both things going for me. So I was very much like people were eager to help me. Um, and I was hiding there and this guy was hiding with me and he's like, what's, are you a journalist? Like, this is what's going on. And he spoke English like really well with an American accent. And I, mm. you know, I, I didn't even think about it at the time. I'm like, who is this guy who speaks English so well? Because it, often in Yemen, it wasn't the case. And also with such an American accent, it was strange. And then it turned out, I found out nine months later that, that I was hiding with him. And then the sniper fire stopped a bit. So I made my way to the field hospital and it was awful. I mean, that was the, the mm. it was really, I mean, it was the turning point in Yemen's protest movement. Absolutely, for a number of reasons. Um, also, because the government sort of in Yemen, there's there used to be kind of a contract that you just don't kill people like that um, because of tribal culture and revenge killing and things like that. So it was mm. a really insane sort of break with that culture and like that they just killed people in cold blood, which I was felt very un Yemeni at that time. Um, now mm. culture in Yemen is changing a bit, but at that time that was very much the case. So. Um, Anyway, that was that was insane. But oh, but that guy I was hiding with by complete coincidence, it ended up being mm. Anwar Aoki's brother, who's Anwar Aoki is the American like guy who was like a member of Al Qaeda and the, and Obama killed with a drone, and he was the first American who was target you know target assassination. And that yeah. was that that was Anwar's brother, Amar. <laughs> who, oh my god, it was just a cruel coincidence. It was so funny. Um, and he was, I mean, very kind and, and I've, I've known him since and he's a really nice guy, but, um, it was, I mean, he was there at the, I, you know, I don't know if he was protesting or just checking it out to see what was happening and then got caught in the gunfire. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was crazy. I'm trying to think of all of the, the, 
you know, I don't want to talk about all of these crazy things that happened to me sometimes in this way when it was like the, you know, it's definitely, I mean, I firstly, I, 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 I thankfully wasn't injured. And then also, you mm. know, when so many Yemenis were, and then I do think that, I do think that they even like snipers and people shooting, they would not shoot a foreigner, but intentionally, which is so, I think goes against what people think when it comes to Yemen, but there really was the protect the foreigner mindset. So I just think that, you know, I was, it, 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 it did make me a little more safe. Obviously you can accidentally get shot. I mean that, you know, but I was so obviously a foreigner as well, because I was a woman who was uncovered. So it was, you know, Yemeni women almost all covered. So it, 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 um, that was very much the case, you know, it was a privileged position and I don't want it to be, you know, it was about so much. It wasn't about me. It was about so many, so, you know, so much other, so many other things. Um, I think when it started to get, I think the time maybe that you're thinking of, maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There was the time that I was also uh, hiding in a, it was when like a literal war started in saw um, between, and that was September 18th actually um between the government side and then the side of the army that had split from the government and they started sort of firing artillery fire back and forth at each other um and that lasted for a few months and that kind of was kind of brought the end of things but not quite um it was a little bit more sort of negotiations behind the scenes that I think brought the end of things the end of Sala but um that was when that started I was in a uh stuck in a building that was got hit by, I think artillery fire or an RPG. I'm not sure which, but something hit above mm. us. Um, I was in this yet yeah, office of Yemeni journalists uh, who were. Um, uh, I was in this office of Yemeni journalists who were. Um, I worked with often. I'm a great and this guy the journalist who I worked with often uh, worked from that office and yeah, it was like an op kind of an opposition media site too. So. It might have been being targeted or it might have been a coincidence, but that was crazy. I mean, that was definitely the most scared that I ever was, um, was then because it just, it, you know, I mean, the sound of artillery fire is very loud and it was the first time I had heard it and it just, it kind of takes things up another notch from gunfire, you know? So mm -hmm. that was, um, that was pretty intense. I, you know, I think, um, let's check really quick here. Okay. I can stay, I can stay for like another 15 minutes. Mm. Okay, okay. We we can continue, but then we can continue as on Sunday like, as well. Yeah. As you as you like, I have yeah. like another fifteen minutes. So. Okay. As you like. Go ahead. You had something you were talking about. Oh no! I um, I'm just trying to. Yeah, I don't that. Uh, it was it. I guess the, the how I would how I would kind of my 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 strongest memory is of that time you know and again it was 10 years ago but my strongest memories are the you know not like these moments of being scared and things like that um but i mean those are strong memories but um, it's more so the sort of the the spirits of change square which was the name of the, the sit in ensana um mm. when it was it was so utterly like it was such a love there was such a lovely spirit there and there was i mean there was some obviously, you know, there were, there was, it wasn't perfect. There was infighting and, um, particularly regarding the role of women protesting and people, how people regarded the role of women protesting. But in general, like the tent that I hung out in a lot, which was full of independent young people, it was so cool. Like it was so cool. Everyone was so hopeful, but also like really there's a spirit of reconciliation there in Yemen, like, like tribes who had been fighting in the past signed peace agreements and said that they weren't going to fight anymore. And then the other thing that was so amazing, and I want to say like even, it was so amazing in regards to Yemen is that there were no weapons in Change Square. So mm. it was like, uh, every, there were these, there were checkpoints around the square and people did not bring in guns. And I mean, I spent a lot of time there and I do not think people shot back. I mean, it wasn't until the very end that people started shooting back. I started, you know, the army, they literally had an army that was defending them that started fighting, but the actual protests themselves were never fighting. And it was, I mean, sometimes they threw stones, but like, that was it. There was never this, and, and in Yemen where like, you know, I mean, everyone had a gun in Yemen. I mean, not everyone, yeah. uh, tribal men in the North had guns in Yemen. I mean, it was that, yeah. that is very much part of the culture. And you know, there's a lot of, um, 
there's a lot of fighting amongst tribes, you know, mostly it's for like land and water resources, uh, but it's quite common. And that was, it was really remarkable, the sort of the, the no weapons, I mean, people didn't believe it, that there were no weapons there, um, mm. but it was, it was true. And there were no weapons. There was, um, people really wanted to sort of bridge these. So Salo had been like a real divider um, cause he had this sort of like divide and conquer and like, let's keep some general chaos yeah. in Yemen so that I can rule. And that was, um, I think people really wanted to overcome that there and it was really beautiful. And it's, you know, it's, it's given where Yemen is today. It's, it's so sad. Um, you know, it gets really, de- it's, it's really depressing to think about that, but, uh, the, um, the, the I don't know, it's like nice to remember that, remember that, that spirit. Mm of reconciliation existed at one time at change square and i mean also in Taz mm. to an extent and also in, and added to an extent so i'm not as familiar with the protests there mm. um but around the country you know it was like it was like elsewhere where there's protests all around the country and, and mm. very, i mean even in socotra the yemeni the mm. islands and the yeah. you know what about the media tent in change square can you tell us more about the atmosphere yeah. people you met there and how, how it was all functioning Yeah, yeah. So it was this tent that was like young people who were doing social media, who all were like basically independents at that time, young people, um, you know, to the best of my knowledge, maybe, you know, some, I mean, I really think they were independent. I know some of them well. Um, and it was, you know, with men and women together, they were, so they were trying to get like social media out, social media from the square out. Um, and then a lot of them, you know, they started it. Um, organizations like there was an organization called Support Yemen that was putting out a lot of media about what was going on that sort of was born out of that group of young people. Um, they were doing like media training, like some of um, some like more educated, you know, Yemenis who had more experience, more background, were doing like media training for other people, and like it was all this. Just it did feel very like young people, young youth, and you know that sort of thing when you think about like the best part about the Arab Spring that was it was sort of in that tent. Um, you know, people full of hope and educate, you know, and, and I mean, not all, not all of them, I think were university kids, but um, most of them were, and, and the, you know, and, and um, sort of, you know, Yemenis were very aware of the bad reputation that Yemen had uh, in the West, and they wanted to, you know, try to rectify that in a way, and, you know, we're not all terrorists sort of thing. Um, What else about that tent? What else were they? You know, I, I just have such like, I just like hung, you know, my mostly I just like hung out there. Like it was just, I would go there and just sit and hang out and I would chew cot there, which is, you know, the, the Yemeni drug uh, yeah. of choice. And, you know, I, all, many Yemenis chew. I mean, the majority of Yemenis chew daily. Um, I did not chew daily, but I chewed mm. often. And it was just fun to go there in the afternoon and sit with them. Uh, you chew after lunch and go after lunch sit, and then just listen to the people talk and mm. like you know and that was some of my best memories of from yemen in general um, oh, and, and what does it do the the cut chewing it cut? makes you more yeah. alert it, ma- it makes you it makes you more alert yeah it makes yeah. you it's it's like kind of some sort of mix between uh cough like it is kind of like a double espresso in an empty stomach mm. but then also it makes you a little bit like a little bit, it's not how I like any other drug. So that's why I have a hard time describing it, but it makes you sort of get ideas and like think about ideas and th- it, it, it makes you concentrate on things. Um, mm. Maybe not necessarily on like smart things, but I remember someone saying to me once that like all Yemeni political decisions were made. This was pre the war, pre the war. Mm. Now it's not as funny anymore, but uh, it was like all Yemeni political decisions were made when people were high on cot, and that's why they're all stupid. <laughs> like because you're always like, you're always like, I don't know, having some idea in your head about what, uh, like this is a great idea. Like one time I got, um, and I'm not the only person I know foreigner. I know who's done this. Is one time after chewing, I like. Um, I was like, became obsessed with people who I went to high school with. And I started writing them long messages. <laughs> like, <laughs> why did they, I was like, I'm in Yemen. And blah, blah, blah. It's just so <laughs> silly. <laughs> but um, I mean, it doesn't make you that high. I mean, I can tell you that most foreign journalists who were in Yemen have done like live BBC interviews while they're high on cot. <laughs> it, 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 I don't want to name any names, but, or while they're chewing. And it, 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 it you don't know, like, you don't, uh, it, nobody knows. Um, 
it does. Yeah. It's not, it's not that crazy of a drug. I mean, you can definitely do it and basically do You can chew and then do anything else you want to do. You might just kind of, I don't know. It depends how high you are too. Cause yeah. you know, like anything there's levels. Uh, the other thing that's annoying about cot is you have to do it for a long time to feel the effects of it. So yeah. it's like, you kind of need to chew for four hours or at least three hours. <laughs> so it's really a, it's a, it's a commitment of a drug. <laughs> it's a strong time commitment. But you know, it's the nice thing about cot is that, I mean, there's a lot of bad things about cot. So I don't mm. want to, it, it takes people's money who don't have any money. It's bad for the, growing it is bad for the environment. So like lots of bad things. Um, mm. It is though, it's so social, you know, people don't really chew alone that often. Sometimes students will chew alone and then study, but like often people chew, it's a very social thing. So that, and it makes you want to talk. Mm. So like that was really nice. It's just, it's so nice that like every afternoon there's always a way to like sit and hang out with people because every afternoon people are chewing. So I also was doing fighting when, when people were fighting. Uh, I don't know if this is true anymore in the war, but like how it used to be is that when people were fighting, soldiers were fighting, there was always a break between mm. like 12 to two or like 12 to three for caught chewing. And then like they'd resume again, but like everyone knew that it was like safe to move around in those hours because everyone was, it was like the sacred time. So, and people, and, and, and soldiers from like opposing sides would sit together and chew. It was like, the, I used to be like, what is this? And then I, so some old people told me like there were stories from world war two when like, I think French and German soldiers would play soccer or football together, like during, you know, mm -hmm. some, well, they, in between fighting. And it reminded them of like the cot thing where people would chew together in between fighting. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a strange drug. And it's also strange that you have to consume it is right after it's picked. So it's not really something that like exports well. Mm. Um, it, and you can dry it, but it's not very nice dried. So I was mm. basically just done in Yemen, Ethiopia, Kenya, Djibouti, Somalia, mm. a little bit, I think in Southern Saudi Arabia, but illegally. And during this whole thing, and anyway, you went to uh, in change square, <laughs> and uh, you know all the killing and the violence and the escalation. Do you, how was the humor situation there? Do you remember some jokes, like mm. dark, dark stuff? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, Yemenis yeah, are great at dark humor, as are Egyptians. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's definitely, I don't, oh God, though, I'm not going to say, I, I don't really remember any, which is really sad. The only one, definitely there were jokes. I mm. mean, you know, I remember like this guy, this is like not that funny of a one, but I had mm. this guy would like go through like change square. This like ice, poor like ice cream salesman would like go through and selling his ice cream. And he's just like, um, he would he would just he would just like start yelling like Ali Sala is gonna leave and it's all because and like change comes from within ice cream like so you're gonna want some ice cream or like things you know things like that um what else do I what else are some of the funny humor that I have uh, um I mean people definitely make fun of Sala a lot he's pretty he was pretty easy to make fun of um mm -hmm because he was kind of an uneducated tribesman as well so he and he talked like a really uneducated tribesman so he was easy to make fun of he's not he wasn't like from a sheikh family or anything like that um so i what and he, he smuggled know, whiskey earlier in his career right oh uh, yeah he really he was a whiskey smuggler. Yeah, yeah 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 and he 100 it's a true story like i because mm. i have since written about him um and so that's how he found favor like in the Yemeni army. So he was like, um, I think now, I, don't, I think he was, he was um, stationed in Taz, which also includes, the governor also includes the port of Mocha, um, mm. which is like, you know, where coffee comes from port in Yemen, Mocha. And uh, he, so it's a port. So it's, so whiskey would come in from Africa. So it would, um, and he, they kind of like put him in charge of the whiskey smuggling. And because of that, he like got favor with a lot of high level people and he was really good at sort of utilizing that favor he would get with people to sort of work his way up the army. Um, he was a genius. I mean, he was a political genius uh, for sure. I mean, in some ways, he, you know, he ended up getting killed in a horrible way. So that wasn't that smart, but it, for a long time, he was a political genius. So um, I mean, genius in a way, genius when it came to his own, you know, getting, 
benefiting himself and his family, not in terms of running a successful country. He ran Yemen into the ground. So, uh, but uh, genius in terms of how to stay in power and how to enrich himself and his family. Um, but, oh God, I wish, you know what? The humor thing is like, I wish I could answer that question better because the humor, humor is so important to me, but I'm a person who also, I don't remember jokes very well. So mm-hmm. I, it, it, oh my God, you know, it, the, I, yeah, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to say anything, but people are always laughing, you know, it's mm-hmm. the sort of, it's the sort of place where people are always laughing and having fun. I, I just remember this isn't so much an inside joke, but it's just, I have this video of this guy. So it's something I remember where he um, was, it's like, change, there was like the middle of change square. Hmm. And there was like a big stage at the middle where sometimes people would, you know, give speeches or people would recite poetry or things like that, or make announcements. Um, but for some reason, the area was like cleared out a bit and he was just lying down. So Yemenis, um, they relax, they sit on a way that they lean on their left elbow I don't know if if you know if that's common yeah, elsewhere. Yeah, I, th- I think I, I saw. Yeah. Yeah. He sit on their left elbow, and I have this. <laughs> I have a view of this guy. He just was like sprawled out. He's wearing like a thobe, you know, or like a galabea yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And he's wearing, and he's like, he's like lying on the on the pavement on the ground, using his sandal as like his, to prop up his <laughs> left elbow, and he just like waves at me like this, and just like lying there, and you know, it's things like that that I have memories of that are just. Like, what are you doing buddy um or um i have some videos of like i can i mean i could send them to you of like this guy just like they were playing like just this like kind of silly like political song that was just like irhal, 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 ya Ali, and like blah, blah. and this guy just like dancing to himself like to the side like this like whatever but then like everyone watching him laughing it was such a <laughs> but it was like people get a kick out of things you know like that and it was uh yeah I wish I, the jokes are important and I wish I could remember them more, but it's more so just the feeling of it all, you know, this feeling of like not taking themselves too seriously and uh, things like that, which, which are the general memory, which I really appreciate. Right. So since um, time isn't on, on our time right now and we're just you know, barely sketching the surface. So let's wrap yeah. this episode up on the, um, like the title of your book, Don't Be Afraid of the Bullets. Uh, how did that come to be? Yeah, of course I know, but you should tell the yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so he, so um, on that day, on March 18th, which was the day of the massacre, uh, March 18th, like the, uh, 2011. 2011, yeah, yeah, which was the day of the the big massacre and the biggest massacre at Change Massacre at Change Square, and then also like the day that sort of kicked everything off and changed things. Um, the that day I remember when I was hiding like that story when I was hiding with with um, um Anwar's brother uh behind his gates I remember I was like sort of looking out between the gate and the wall looking at people in the streets and there were still some people shooting I mean kind of and it wasn't as intense shooting as before but like the snipers were still shooting down and I saw this guy walking um with a megaphone walking down the street just yelling like uh, and don't be afraid of the bullets and it was it was seemed so crazy at the time um and then what i realized as time went on is that uh yemenis are often it's common particularly yemenis from more like the northern tribal areas kind of aren't afraid of bullets which mm. i've had people i remember a taxi driver once saying to me there was some shooting happening around where we were it was when there was actual war happening in the capital and um i said don't drive on that street they're shooting on that street and he like looked back at me and was like why you're scared of a bullet a bullet is like a really small thing laura like the chances that it's gonna hit you are like it's not gonna hit you and and this, the problem what and, and many people did believe that i mean it was it was true and you know there you're around gunfire for so often you, you can come to think that and yeah. I also have a theory, I don't know if this is true or not, but, and well, this is true. Often in Yemeni tribal conflict, they, people didn't aim to kill. They would shoot above each other's heads on purpose. And it was just a matter of like, who makes the most noise. Hmm. Um, and then they would, so then what happens, I think people got used to gunfire and gunfire that didn't kill. So uh, that's my theory. Uh, and that, 
So they were used to being around gunfire that was like shot above each other's heads. And so they became not afraid of bullets. But then obviously when it's like pointing at you, it's pretty easy to shoot someone. So anyway, the, the thing was, is that it, and even, you know, I had my Yemeni, a Yemeni journalist who I worked with all the time when we were walking, we saw an RPG when the war started, hit a building. And he said to me, Laura, why are you afraid of an RPG? It's really, it's like, and he showed, he's like, look at the hole the RPG made. It's a really small hole. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> But though he, he truly thought that, and he truly was like, Laura, look, it just made a small hole in the building. So it it was really, um, I don't know, it, it, you know, it's 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 kind of a it's it's I I don't know if it's good or bad or it's it's a lot of things uh, that Yemenis aren't afraid of bullets, but it um, it definitely was a theme throughout throughout the year and something that was said often I mean don't be afraid of the bullets was something said often and then even after my time there and after being there for a while I started to feel the same way you know I started to think oh well the chances a bullet's going to hit you are very small so mm. why do you need to be afraid of it but that's you know that is when you start to have traumatic you know trauma thinking kind of coming in and uh and talking to you instead which is probably what a lot of Yemenis are dealing with sort of on a daily basis so I yeah um that's where this, that's where the title came from. It was a pretty catchy title. I always think I'm always hesitant about it because I feel like people think that I named it that just for attention, which I did yeah. in a way, but it also <laughs> was, it was also such an important yeah. thing. Like, you know, it was people said it at change square all the time. Like it, I, I, I heard it all the time. Um, so people said it to me directly, you know, like I said, and you said, Oh, a bullet's small. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was something, it was, uh, that's the theme. That's where the that's where it came from. Thank you, Laura, for your time, and we shall meet uh, next week. The, yeah. 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 That sounds yeah. good. Um, yeah. and should we talk about? Can we talk about uh, it now? Yeah. One one sec. <laughs> so people listening, thank you guys for listening. You could um, reach me via email at um, podcast at gmail dot com. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Apple Podcasts everywhere thank you guys for listening